Thank you so much. This is a wonderful crowd this evening. I want to welcome you to the University of Scranton. My name is Julie Schumacher-Cohen. I'm Assistant Vice President for Community Engagement and Government Affairs, and I want to welcome you to tonight's presentation on Black History and Housing in Scranton with Glynis Johns of the Black Scranton Project. Let me share just a few brief acknowledgments around uh, how the talk came about. I will introduce our speaker, and then we will get underway. So tonight's event is both a community-based learning talk, a CBL talk, we call it, and it's also part of a project called Scranton Story, Our Nation Story. So CBL talks, and some of the students, I know you're here, uh, to, hear, to have an opportunity to hear from a community partner that comes to campus and shares on a particular topic. So this semester, we have three different CBL talks, and tonight is the first one. And I want to especially thank the Multicultural Center and the PCPS Dean's Office for their partnership uh, on those. And you can find out more information in the back about the ones that we have the rest of the semester. And students, you will receive reflection questions tomorrow. So check that out in your email box. Um, but especially this event is about is part of the Scranton Story, Our Nation Story project. And some of you have been at these events over the last year and a half. We are very um, grateful to the National Endowment for the Humanities, which has supported it. And it has really aimed to share a multifaceted story of Scranton, including a focus on underrepresented histories and stories. So since 2021, we've been hosting lectures and dialogues, story exchanges, um, community uh, walking tours, and we've been collecting oral histories. And that's going to be the focus, actually, of this year, is an oral history project that will culminate in November. These efforts are aimed at considering how we can stitch together a more complete local and national narrative in ways that help us build community here in Scranton and hopefully also help strengthen our democracy. Our current theme is focused on black history and heritage. So I want to especially thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, as well as Lackawanna Heritage Valley and the Scranton Area Community Foundation. They are also helping to fund some of the oral histories. Again, uh, you'll see two previewed very briefly tonight. And then in November, we'll be releasing about 30 Spotlight Scranton stories that will be a lasting asset of the project. So tonight's topic is focused on black history uh, of Scranton in relation to housing, in particular a neighborhood right here in downtown Scranton where Midtown Apartments currently sits that had been home to a predominantly African-American community prior to a process of redevelopment. So we're really seeking tonight to open a conversation um, about this story um, and to understand more about it and the historical context, especially as we consider racial disparities in housing in Scranton today, an issue that we also know is a national one as well. So I'm pleased now to introduce Glynis Johns. She is CEO and founder of the Black Scranton Project, which is a local heritage initiative dedicated to archiving and celebrating black history and culture in the Scranton, Pennsylvania region. If you don't know Glynis, you should. Uh, she is a mover and shaker around Scranton, around the state, and around the country. She's a graduate of Scranton High School and St. John's College with her bachelor's and master's in sociology. Her work has been recognized in many ways, including serving on the Governor's Commission on African American Affairs. She's been honored by US Senator Bob Casey as a leader creating change in Pennsylvania. She's been featured as a TEDx Scranton speaker on why local black history matters, and most recently in a mini documentary on the institutions preserving black history in Northeastern PA, which won a regional Emmy Award. Woo! <laughs> uh, she, she's currently shepherding the Black Scranton Project Center for Arts and Culture, which is located in North Scranton, and they will have other events going on throughout Black History Month. Um, I'm always grateful to have the opportunity to work with Glynis, and of course, the Black Scranton Project is a core community partner that's part of the Scranton Story Project altogether. That project has many, many different community partners, so we're always grateful to all that collaboration. So Glynis will, will present for about 40 minutes or so, or so. Um, then we're hopeful to open it up for Q&A. Uh, we will want to try to uh, stay right to about 7 p.m., so if we do have more questions, we'll be happy to stay after. I'm also I'm mindful that we have a mix of university students and community members here tonight, including um, some neighbors for whom this history is part of your own personal story. Um, so we do, again, hope that this will foster an ongoing discussion in the community. We'll also have some guidance uh, at the end about how you can share your Scranton story, because we are continuing to collect uh, oral histories as part of the project. OK, I will now turn things over to Glynis. two beverages, some peppermint tea and some water, so, so you know. But thank you, Julie, for the presentation, for the introduction, so nice. Wow, there's a lot of people here in the room, um, and I just want to say it is really, it's been a, it's, it's a lot to see myself here now versus 2018 
when I begged the university in the multicultural affairs department if I can just talk about my research. I just graduated from St. John's University at the time, super energized and super passionate about bringing our stories to light. At that time, we probably had about a third of the people in the room here, and now to see all these seats filled up is really incredible to see this happen when I thought no one wanted to hear what I had to say about local black history. Um, <clears throat> Before we jump in to this project tonight and this story, um, I just wanted to say a few things. Number one, I am not an expert on housing, and we're going to be focusing on a very particular area tonight, which is from approximately the late 1940s into about the 1970s, and then I'm going to touch on some things present day. We don't have that much time, so I'm going to try and be quick and leave enough space so we guys can have so we can have some dialogue and things. Um, I'm not going to get too much into my own bio since Julie did such a fantastic job. For those who don't know, the Center for Arts and Culture is now in North Scranton inside of the former PNC Bank where we're doing a lot of historical work. We have several programs and we have four pillar programs now that we're focused on, which is our Black History Month series, which we are currently in right now, um, uh, our Black Excellence Gala, which we um, premiered last year, Juneteenth, and some open mics. Some of the things that we're planning to do in the Center for Arts and Culture, we want to have a recording studio, co-working spaces, art and design lab, classrooms, um, space to hold events, space for folks to come out and have like baby showers, birthday parties, etc. cetera. Um, I'm not going to waste time on history on the bank because we can do that in another day. <laughs> um, I wanted to spotlight a couple of the events that I just mentioned, like our inaugural Black Excellence Gala. I know a handful of people were in the room that night last year. It was a really great event. We're planning on making that a biannual event. Juneteenth, our block party is always a huge success. Last year, we had a ton of folks came out. We had a music stage. We had food, community. It's a really great time. And then here's a few other things that we have going on this year as well. We also do open mics. Our next one is tomorrow, if you're interested. Um, and we also do like art exhibits and different cool things in the space. As I mentioned before, the first time I was here, this is like the opening slide from my first presentation pretty much ever on this research, and it was February 13th, 2018. I named it after my graduate thesis at the time, But You're Black, the Overlooked Community of Pennsylvania. And so moving it full forward, I feel like we've been able to shine a light in the past five years on what's been going on. So it's very cool. I wanted to start out with this quote. Um, this is a quote that actually accelerated my graduate work back in 2015. I was studying, trying to find anything that I could at the time about the black community in Scranton. What were people saying? Where were we? How are we situated in the historical context of the city? So in this text, A Brief History of Scranton, Pennsylvania by Cheryl A. Kashuba, she writes, whatever moved them to leave their homeland, they came seeking employment. But the immigrants who came here came here to do more than just work. They came to live, and with them, they brought the elements that made a rich and diverse social and cultural climate. So for me, this quote struck me. It made me feel like, of all of the people that are coming to Scranton, black folks had nothing else to give but labor. And I wanted to know why. Why, why wasn't this area our home? So to put that into context with this other quote from the Scranton Republican, which was the Scranton Times before it was called the Scranton Times in uh, 1913 that said, Scranton was never figured as a station on the old Underground Railroad, but up in the Abington, the Negro had many friends who was always ready to give him shelter. So one thing I thought was interesting about this quote in the previous one, it still fashioned Scranton as this space that never really catered to the black community, was never really seen as home. Yes, we were part of the Underground Railroad. Yes, we did things to be a part of the abolitionist movement, but we kind of, we're not really in the mix. Like Black folks here are transient, they live and work, but they're not so much into the community. And I think that legacy kind of seeped into what we're going to see in a moment. So of those two quotes, there was two major points that I, I pulled out from that. As I said before, the contributions to the community being the Black community was only in the form of labor, which dehumanizes and commodifies the Black body. It also assumes that Black immigrants do not possess social or cultural norms or networks um, to contribute to the community, or rather, these networks have been denied. So before we move into what Midtown looked like, I have to start with where the black community started at. So from the Underground Railroad in Abington, we have a collection, a community um, of 
formerly enslaved black folks who moved through the Underground Railroad and ended up in Waverly, Pennsylvania, which is right in the Abingtons area. Um, from there, they moved to Scranton, most of them, because in the Waverly area, there wasn't many opportunities for jobs. So yes, they were able to gain, their, gain access to their freedom here in northeastern Pennsylvania, but in Waverly, there wasn't many job opportunities. So a lot of those folks ended up moving to the downtown area <clears throat> of Scranton, Pennsylvania. So this is an old railroad map from the late 1800s. But I did go and highlight all of the neighborhoods, all of the spots that I knew specifically that the black community was living. So this is this circled area is mainly, mainly between Franklin and Adams Avenue, Penn. So like all, if you're familiar with the mall, if you think between Penn, I'm not going to do a whole map situation, but it's basically the downtown. Um, Oakford Court, Lee Court, Raymond Court, um, Moore Court, Cressler Court, those are all spaces in between the main streets and avenues that the black community was living. Um, up until about the 1920s, 1930s, there was a first wave of redevelopment that pushed the black community further up into Central City. This is an older photo from 1949. Um, there, they were doing um, a survey of the city of Scranton and trying to find the blighted most darkest slum areas of the community. And so they, were, they got government funding to do some surveys, which is the precursor to the 1960s big redevelopment project. Um, and I just wanted to show uh, some of these photos because I thought they were really beautiful. This is Oakford Court. Um, if you're familiar with uh, Linden Street, um, what's over there? Um, is that Linden Street, Penn Avenue? And Linden, if you know where like Noir Spirits is now, there's another like, and if you know where um, Paisley, their architectural firm is, there's like a little alley right there. That is part of Oakford Court where this would be in downtown Scranton. Um, so they went around, they took some pictures, some surveys of people there. Um, when I found this photo, I thought it was really interesting because there's not many living photos of black residents in Scranton. So anytime I see some, I have to, I have to acquire. So I put this newspaper clipping um, because it was published in 1947. This photo is from 1949. But um, they, it's basically talking about the conditions in downtown Scranton in this area and the work that was going to be do, going to happen to start redeveloping and rehabbing the quote unquote downtown in the slums of the downtown area. All right, now we're getting to the good part. So I found this document. Um, this is a plan from the city of Scranton. I found it at an antique shop about three years ago. At the time, I already knew it was going to be something important to use, but I didn't know how valuable it would be until last year or two. And especially because it talks about Adams Avenue. So when we decided to, to look at Adams Avenue around the University of Scranton as a particular point, um, it worked out perfectly in talking about um, Midtown Apartments. So from this section, I'm going to talk about like what is really happening more in depth and also giving you clips from this document. Um, I haven't seen anyone have it in the community and I wanted to highlight a few of the people who worked on it which were um, the City of Scranton's Planning Commission, the SRA, Scranton's Redevelopment Authority, Scranton's Downtown Development Authority. I thought it was interesting that it was also published in February of 1966. So a couple excerpts from inside of the book. The plan must have been must be based on a realistic knowledge of the existing conditions in the core area. Extensive field surveys were undertaken during the summer of 1963, which have provided this necessary information. These surveys covered the entire core area, which is generally bounded by the Lackawanna River, Jefferson Avenue, Gibson, and Lackawanna Ave. The results of the surveys are below. So here are a couple more snapshots just of some of the conditions in the area. Um, I'll show you some maps to really explain where the core area is. That was kind of the same slide here. But one thing, I, uh, a few of the, of the data that was in this document I thought was interesting, which is also talking about the retail places and how many people lived, were employed in the downtown area. All right, so the key on top of there is kind of blurry, so bear with me. None of the red spots have anything to do with redlining. It's mostly retail and spaces downtown. But what I really want you to focus on is the Adams Avenue redevelopment plan. So this is where they said that this area is important to vigorous, is important and vigorous portion of the downtown and contains specifically specialty stores not duplicated anywhere in the area. 
Existing problems of this area include traffic and parking congestions and a number of deteriorated buildings along Adams Avenue. The serious traffic problems on Adams Avenue can be improved by the proposed change to the one-way couplet of Jefferson and Madison Avenues, clearance of the deteriorated buildings, and the constructions of additional parking spaces, pedestrian walkways, and new commercial construction on clear land will all serve to enhance the area. So that was their main plan for this, for this area. And at the time, there were at least 60 families living in the Adams Avenue region. So I pulled this map from inside of the plan because I wanted to show you guys the best that I can of what redlining might have looked like in the city of Scranton. I've searched everywhere. I haven't seen any redlining maps in particular, but this is the closest one that I can see that kind of maps out what the housing conditions were in, this, in the downtown central city area of Scranton. So um, where we're mostly concerned is at the bottom right-hand corner, that is the section of Adams Avenue that we're going to be focused on. As you can see, the dark red is substandard, and most of that is in that area as well. Um, and good is in bright red, and then fair is in that pinkish area. This is another map that is explaining and outlining the project areas to which they're going to start. They're all numbered in priority area. And as you can see, the number one priority is over in that Adams Avenue region that I just talked about for their urban renewal development plan. And so here's a little bit about the key project areas. So eight new urban renewal projects are proposed for the core area. These eight projects neither include, neither include to exist, neither include the existing central, central city urban renewal area nor the persons of Westside G, NRP, and Washington Avenue projects, which are located within the core area. Following is a brief description of each of the individual core areas. So I only pulled one of them because we're not reading the whole document today. <laughs> but project number one, this first project is, like I said, is going to be focused in that Adams Avenue area. But the part that I, is most important is that it's bookended by Central High School and Tech High School. So Tech High School is now Northeast Intermediate, and Central is Lackawanna College, for those who, weren't, who didn't know what those two schools were. OK. so. Um, before I get into this video clip, um, I am so excited because this is kind of rare footage that I have. So me and my mom, we are cleaning out our closet, cleaning out a family closet, and we found all of this old 8 millimeter film that belonged to my grandfather. And she was like, we should just probably get rid of it. There's no way to look at it. I'm like, there's no way we can get rid of this. I got a film scanner, and I was able to scan all of the film that was my grandfather's. Really cool to see all of the film for my family. There was one film piece that he had where he scans Adams Avenue in the 60s. It was about 1963. So three years, three years before the construction for Midtown Apartments took place, three years before this project was released, and all around the time that they were doing the surveying for this project, and specifically project number one, the Adams Avenue redevelopment project. So I'm going to show this here. It's a silent video because it's from 1963. But um, it's a really great video to kind of get a glimpse at what the community looked like. I'm going to show you later um, some newspaper clippings. Um, during the time, they talked about how slummish the area looked and, you know, darkest parts of town that needs to be cleaned up. We need to focus on walkways and parking lots and um, focusing more on the schools and building a school and making it that sort of area. Um, but seeing from this, my grandparents' porch in 1963, it looks more like a community. You know, obviously people have different homes. I'm not gonna say that all of the homes weren't blighted, but getting a firsthand view of like my family and family's friends just enjoying themselves inside of the home, you know, on Adams Avenue, just drinking, having a good time. We never get to see black faces like this in our city. And this was right here. This is right in the area that they said was no good for our community, that they all needed to go, that they needed to go into other housing that was going to be built by the community. So um, this is another clip where you can see um, more of Adams Avenue, and you'll see in the back in the back right corner, you'll get a glimpse of the armory, just so you, for context of where this is on Adams Avenue. And that's my lovely grandmother, may she rest in peace, on the film. And shout out to Bill Morgan. This is his footage. 
And so, you know, like reading in this pamphlet how they talked about Adams Avenue versus seeing this firsthand footage from just a few years before, it always made me feel like it's not as bad looking as they made it seem in a way. But um, yeah, I just thought it was just a beautiful piece of footage, being able to see act the actual structures that, they're, that no longer exist there anymore is quite interesting. All right, and so um, this is the map that I showed you before, and the area that is circled is the area um, that my grandparents lived in. Trying to compare it to modern day maps doesn't really work because obviously the city was redeveloped a little bit, but that is the area, and as you can see, all it's, in, it's touching that area of the substandard. So maybe the house or the structure that they lived in was considered in the good or fair. I really have no idea. We only get that little view, but... Um, I just think it's a really, it was a really powerful element to add to this research as we continue to look deeper into um, what Adams Avenue looked like, collecting the stories of our community members from Adams Avenue, and um, art, finding out a way to articulate what redlining looked like in the city of Scranton. And as I mentioned before, this is kind of new research for myself in the university, so we're still trying to piece together a narrative, still trying to put together these elements, and still try to collect the stories of the communities to retell what was actually happening during the time. So um, I'm not gonna go too deep into this either, um, but this was a page in the report that talked about the stages of development. So from 1965 to 1970, that's where they were really prioritizing. They were um, gonna construct the Center City Mall. That didn't necessarily happen then, as we know. That happened in the 90s, but kind of seeing some of the proposed plans that um, they had up until the 80s was quite interesting, seeing some of the things that were complete and seeing some of the things that weren't was interesting um, for me. And also comparing city plans from the 60s to the 80s until 2022 is really interesting, seeing what our ideas have, how our ideas of city planning have shifted throughout decades and what is important and what is a priority was really cool to kind of see alongside of each other. So because we're short on time, I'm kind of moving fast, but I wanted to put this slide up here in case anyone was interested in who actually put together this report. Like I said, I haven't seen many or any other copies of this at all. I don't necessarily know any of these people that are in this report, um, but it's worth studying eventually. So after looking through this report, I wanted to look into the newspapers and see what the community was talking about, see what the city was reporting about. And this was big news. These are all three different years, starting with 1967, 1968. Uh, maybe they're both from 1967 and 1968. Um, but I wanted to show you guys what, um, how big of news it was during the time. Full page ads or full page newspaper spreads um, multiple times. These are just three that I have here. Uh, they're not zoomed in pretty well, but I wanted to give you guys a, um, a view at what they were talking about in the papers. The one on the left, you can see some interior views of um, uh, Midtown Apartments. Um, they actively started the project in at the end of 1966. As soon as, that, as soon as this report pretty much came out, they started construction on it. Um, some of these photos I'll be able to zoom in in a little bit and show you more. Uh, this is the commission that worked on it, standing in front of the properties that would soon be demolished for Midtown Apartments. And so these are some shots. Thank you to the Lackawanna Historical Society for giving us access to some of these beautiful photos. These were smaller ones that happened to be in the newspaper as well, but these are just shots of the, the starting stages of building the Midtown Apartments. And then here's a shot of the people who helped um, get the project off the ground. Mary Scranton's in there, a few other people who I'm not quite familiar with. My apologies, but we can comment on that later. Um, this is one of my favorite photos from that series of the, re of the construction of Midtown Apartments, because you can see the street sign for Chrysler Court. Um, we have some testimonies from residents who lived on Chrysler Court. As I mentioned earlier, the courts and alleys um, were the only places that black folks can pretty much live, not because they didn't want to, but because they weren't allowed to. It doesn't matter if you have the money to purchase it, people probably wouldn't sell it to you. Um, and so when folks got displaced, a lot of them moved to Midtown Apartments. This is another newspaper clipping, and I'm gonna zoom in on a couple of the articles. 
But I thought it was interesting because um, this was front page Sunday, Sunday Times news, right above the Sunday Times, which I've never really seen much. And I've looked at a lot of newspapers. And just the, the title alone is just eye catching in itself. And so this was published in 1968 in July. And basically these two voices from the quote unquote Scranton's ghetto is from Adams, the Adams Avenue area. And they were talking about what it's like with their homes being displaced, where they're gonna go. They spoke with one woman um, who says that she had lived there for 12 years and she, uh, she had lived there for 12 years. And I've heard the expression that you're as good as us at least 300 times. But look around, how many Negro men do you see working in white collar jobs? The white people are worried about interracial marriage. So what? Most of the Negroes don't want interracial marriage any, any more than white people do. Speaking about interracial marriage, she continues, the same white people who are so worried about the first one to come to this area was with five or 10 whatever his wife becomes uncooperative. Um, there was another part where this Thursday speak with a man who he talks about, um, you know, like just feeling like he's part of the neighborhood. He doesn't really want to go anywhere. Like he just kind of doing what they say. They said if he has to move, he's just kind of going to move. Um, there was another woman who um, I think it's on the next slide. She says that she just up and left. Like as soon as they told her that she had to leave, she was going to leave. There was a couple other people who spoke about the confusion that was happening during the time because some folks heard that they had to leave immediately. Some folks were like, they can stay. And if they were um, uh, senior residents and they were able to stay in their apartments before they were being moved into somewhere else, it was very complicated. So they had a forum where they gathered all the community together to talk about what was going on. And they opened it up to, I think, some council members and some members of this commission about what was happening with their living situation. Um, and these are all the, like it says here, like these are all the residents from the tech area um, and people living in that zone that was going to be demolished. And as it says in the middle, many of the residents said that their homes were, were substandard and the relocation sites were worse. The changes stem primarily from the recent announcement that some 400 persons in the 500 and 600 blocks of Adams Abs must move to make way for redevelopment. These are some more newspaper clippings from the time about how people feel. Um, oh yeah, here it goes. The woman that said she was the first to move. Um, Councilman Brazil said that the SRA shows the population ratio was two to one white over non-white and that the plan is for the people. But a lot of people didn't feel that way during the time. They also felt like it was very racialized. The people that were being forced to move were mostly the people of color and mostly in the Mo like we're mostly in the black community. Yes, it was mixed. There was Jewish folks living there. There was white folks. There was all different people living around. But the folks who were mostly displaced and didn't have better housing opportunities were the black residents of Scranton. So these are just some more clippings um, and quotes about how people were feeling. This one's from a survey conducted by the University of Scranton students in 1967, um, talking about talking about their concern over the housing conditions. And here's another one, um, which was also an interesting dialogue was going back and forth. This was like a whole page conversation um, about what is happening during this time with the housing displacement, discrimination, um, and what people are going to do. We see Mr. Cullen here saying to another man, um, Elmer Smith, um, Elmer, if a man had money to buy a house in any other neighborhood and he were a Negro living in Scranton, would he be able to do that? And then, Mr. Smith replies, no, and I can tell you from experience when a Negro goes to purchase a black, goes to purchase a home in Scranton, he might go to a realtor to ask for a place. The realtor will in return go through the neighborhood and ask them, what do you think of a Negro moving into the area? And it all depends on his answer that he gets from the people where you will be accepted or not. I'm sure as a woman of color here in the city of Scranton, nothing has changed. Um, <laughs> I've been looking for apartments for several months. Um, I'm actually, which is ironic, because I'm going through my own housing issues and being evicted from my apartment due to market increases and my landlord wanting more money. And just going out and trying to look for apartments, I've been dealing with discrimination. And it's just wild to see that not much has changed. 
it's wild to see the tactics that people go through just to not show you apartments. Like, oh, we just don't have the keys. Or, you know, I had one realtor say to me, how many kids do you have? I'm like, none. Well, how many kids do you plan on having? How many kids are going to live here? Just like, who do you ask those questions to? And seeing, you know, similar sentiments from people from the 1960s, I think we really do have to talk about what housing looks like in Scranton, where people are able to live, and even just like the climate between how people even go about purchasing homes or renting homes. Like, it's sad that I have to bring my white best girlfriend with me to help me find an apartment or even be able to like ask the appropriate questions about an apartment because I'm not given the time of day. And I only mentioned that because um, I just want people to know I'm not the only person. And just because, you know, I might be seen more in the community, I still have a hard time living here. And so I wanted to shift um, to a couple of people in the community that were doing really incredible things. Um, they're not connected to what we just talked about in any particular way. Um, these are just cl clippings that I had in my collection of um, different folks in the community. Um, Miss Alice Green, she was very active in the community, a member of Bethel A&E Church, um, and she was honored in a few different ways. We also have um, uh, um, Miss Clarence Bergen, her son was, an art, was a musician and he was being like getting a lot of accolades and they took a picture of her in the paper and she talked about her music career and how it lended into her son's career. Um, they all lived on Adams Avenue and then we also have um, uh, Robert Plunkett who was a fireman for the city of Scranton and he also designed the logo, their badge. He was a cop? Oh, he was a cop. Excuse me. He was a cop. I'm thinking of somebody else. Mr. Blue? Hogan. Hogan. Okay, I'm thinking of Hogan. Hogan didn't live. He was in he was in fire. This is police. Okay. Police. Sorry. <laughs> Robert Plunkett, he lived in Adams Avenue and he was the first appoint, appointed patrolman in Scranton. I'm thinking about somebody else who was a fireman, but um, as we mentioned before, here's some um, uh, statistics about some of the makeup and racial disparities in housing today. Um, this is from our, the living, living Wage Report that went out a few months ago from the University of Scranton. So we talk about home ownership in Lackawanna County and race in 2019. So we see that there are 69% of homeowners that are white and just 16% are identified as black or African American. Um, so as we can see, there's not as many black homeowners and hasn't really been. So I definitely think that's something that we should pay attention to and kind of work on and figure out what we can do in the city to make changes. And also thinking about like what low income housing looks like and for our city, if there's ways that we can come up with different plans or again, is there ways that we can create housing or housing opportunities that don't block people out so the next part of this project, and we'll wrap it up pretty soon because we're running out of time. So the key part of this whole project is to collect some oral histories and collect stories from people who might have lived on Adams Avenue during that time. So with Julie from the University of Scranton, we started doing some oral histories in the community and collecting stories um, of those, particularly black residents who might have lived in the Adams Avenue area. So we had two interviews to start. Um, Miss Kathy Hardaway spent some time with us and told us her story about living um, on Adams Avenue. But the interesting thing is, in that community, we were all similar, meaning didn't have a whole lot, but didn't know it. Like, you know what I mean? Just didn't know what we didn't have because we had community. We had Eddie's, and I'm sure people would keep credit every now and then not have enough money, and Eddie would, okay, we'll put that $2 on your bill. And I know people did that. Eddie was more than willing to do that. Um, but the other side of Adams Avenue, there was homes. Uh, there was a dress shop owned by a Jewish man. My mom worked in that dress shop every now and then around the holidays to earn extra money. And down, further down in Adams, that was a little bit too far for me to go from Pine, was Jack's. And Jack's today would be like a convenience store. It just had a little bit of everything. That was a little bit far for me to go. And now mind you, when I left that community 
as that community was in the early 70s. Now, I was born 1960. So my memories of that community go to I was about 10, 11, 12 years old, so far as that was concerned. Um, but I will tell you, um, that is who I am when I think of that community. So I don't want to use the word inferior, but at the time, that's what it felt like, right? Because I was in home, we were homeowners. And in America, home ownership is a big, big deal. And I felt that was taken away from us. Now, our family situation was such that we were not going to move into home. I am sure, and I don't, this is my story so far as what happened to my family. I am sure there are black families that live in different parts of Scranton, own homes to this day. That's not the story of my family because of our situation. Um, and when, when I look at it, I do ask myself the question, why that neighborhood? Like, why those blocks between Vine Street and Pine and, you know, North Washington and that? Like, why? Why was that chosen? There's a lot of neighborhoods that maybe, I thought that neighborhood flir was flourishing. It had businesses, it had homes, it had community. And, and I haven't mentioned in that neighborhood, it was the coolest thing, the community centers there. We had Progressive Center that we went to. Um, right in the court there on Jefferson was the JCC, which we were welcome to attend. And also down the street was the CYC, the Catholic Youth Center. So you had uh, the Catholic Youth Center, the Jewish Community Center, and Progressive Center, all there. All youth that played together, worked together, were community together. And I say, like, why'd you have to rip that apart? You know, and I'm sure there's someone that's going to say, hey, Kathy, this is why we did it. I would have a tendency to disagree. Agree. But because we had community. Okay. Sorry, I'm okay. We got it. We got it. <laughs> um, and this is another clip from our oral history project. Um, Ms. Norma Jeffrey, she talks about her experience. The house uh, that we were in was one of the houses that was labeled for being demolished. And I always remember uh, the cameraman coming uh, from Channel 22 at the time, and he came and took pictures of how we were living. And as I think back, I said, how could my mom have let somebody come in and take pictures of those? Probably if we went back in the archives of Channel 22, you would see uh, the pictures of how the water was dripping, you know, all over the place and how unsanitary and unsafe it was for us to live there. So I'm sure that's why redevelopment had to come because those house, our house that we lived in was just one of many houses like that in the neighborhood. And um, once they started to tear down the houses and everything, I was there. My mom had to move out. They had to find some place to go. They didn't find it for you. You had to find your own place to go. Well, I think I've always had a sense of belonging because of the Progressive Center. And I think that's why I'm so pulling for the Black Scranton Project and what little bit I can do with that because it's so necessary. You feel a part. I feel a part because of my Girl Scouts, because of the brownies, because of the dancers, and seeing the, um, the Elks men come in and do their thing, whatever they did at night. So it always felt like I belong there. When I pass it now, I get like a sense of, oh, what happened? But I also know that you, what was yesterday cannot be today. What worked yesterday doesn't necessarily work today. So um, I do ha have that feeling and longing for it to be like it was, but it's never going to be like it was then. Um, you know, I just have to move on. So I wanted, we, I wanted to include that part um, about the Adams Avenue community with two stories from folks who lived on Adams Avenue, um, because I think their story is important, and I didn't really touch too much on what the, the experiences of folks were outside of those quick newspaper clippings that I've shown, and because some of those folks still live here. Like, some people probably did move away, but a lot of the people who lived on Adams Avenue 
in the 1960s still live in the community with us, are still active in the community, are still participating, and are still having families and building legacies here as well. And so, like Kathy said, like Miss Norma said, like why why this neighborhood? Why did they choose this block? And the reason um, we, we picked these two clips for this presentation also is to talk about the two different types of housing that we've kind of seen. We got a, we got a glimpse of my grandparents' house, looked a little bit different probably from Miss Kathy's house and Miss Norma's house. So there were different types of properties. Maybe there could have been reinvestment into rebuilding up properties, um, but not destroying it in a way that literally took away the community where you can't see it anymore. Um, so we continued this project by sharing our Scranton story with the University of Scranton. We have pop-up events where you can share your story with us. Um, we also have another layer of collecting stories, which we did in the fall, our tintype project with the Lackawanna tintype project. Um, and we captured portraits of friends in the community and we collected their story and asked them what Black Scranton meant to them, um, talk a little about their experience living here in the city of Scranton. It was a really cool layer um, to collecting these stories. And it was really fun getting to see people um, interact with a vintage type of photography. For those who don't know, Tintypes was around in the early 1800s. Um, it's an antique type of photography, kind of the second stage. And um, it's printed on literally a piece of metal on a large format camera that you saw in this. And so Becca, she in her makeshift little dark room outside, she develops all the, the Tintype photos and this is how they came out. We're hoping to have these all on display sometime in the future um, with everyone's stories. So thank you for those in the room who contributed to our stories. There's some people that I've already saw who are in the room that, that we did their tintypes with. So thank you guys for participating in that way as well. And we continue this conversation with our film festivals. We have two more showings. Um, the next one on the 19th is gonna be at the Center for Arts and Culture. We'll be showing um, Becoming Frederick Douglass our friend EJ Murphy, local historian, will be in conversation with us. And then we have on the 26th, Jim Crow of the North that will be showing here at the University of Scranton in the same location. And then on March 8th, we are bringing Julius Fleming Jr. He is a scholar. He wrote the book, Black Patients, Performance, Civil Rights, and the Unfinished Project of Emancipation. He'll be talking about his book and kind of how it relates to this project as well. So I hope you guys enjoyed this presentation and we have some time for some questions. <laughs> that was condensed, but love to have some questions. Okay, so raise your hand if you have a question. Oops, now I'm cold. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Glennis. That was uh, that was a wonderful presentation. It's good Thanks to see you again. Uh, just a uh, kind of a, a follow up on on what you're talking about at Midtown. At the same time, across the street, they they built the Washington Plaza apartments mm -hmm. in that same neighborhood. And I think it's interesting, and many people don't know this. About ten years ago, they went in to renovate those apartments, mm -hmm. and when the city inspectors went in, they uh, they said that they had to condemn the whole development. Wow. Uh, before they could begin renovations. And so it did not meet code 10 years ago, and it did not meet code back in the 1960s. So they went in and tore that neighborhood down, saying that it was substandard housing, and they built substandard housing there for the people. Wow. I did not know that. Um, in the redevelopment project, it said that they were going to build two, I think I might even have it in here. Let's just take a look back. We're flipping, we're flipping. Um, they they said somewhere that they wanted to have two develop like two projects and I thought it would be Midtown and Washington Plaza. They they said in this survey that there was two sp two spots that they were two large. I'm trying to think of the exact words they said in the project. It was two large housing developments that were going to be built in between Central and Tech High School. Which would make sense because isn't well they're right in that same little, but you can see both of them from both angles. So that's why I imagine it was probably that as well. So well, thank and, you. Yeah, and Mike, I think there was there was a slide that you had, Glennis, that talks about how they condemned them, but they really weren't. It wasn't really because of physical. They they just condemned them so people had to move out, not yeah. because they weren't necessarily sub substandard. Questions? Raise your hand. 
Come on. Okay, someone's got a question. Yeah, there it is. The properties are condemned. Yeah. yeah, you can see it on the bottom right. Thanks. I have more of a statement than a question. You were talking about uh, your search for an apartment. Um, it's funny because uh, I just signed a lease for an apartment to move in on the 1st of March. Now, a few people here know me. Um, I just got out of prison two years ago for serving 35 years. Okay, so, but yet I can get an apartment. And it's funny that the apartment that I went to was on Ash Street. I mm. took my wife over there with me and was able to get an apartment. Secondly, there were two single mothers there, I believe. They had kids. And it's weird that they were not able to get that apartment. And I remember the realtor saying, there are no kids in this apartment. So I wonder how much does sexism play into that, uh, play a role in that today? Not only just racism, but sexism. Like I said, all the strikes were against me to get an apartment, in my opinion, but I was able to get this apartment. That's a very nice apartment. So one has to wonder what's really going on there. And to what Ms. Hardaway was saying, I think the answer, in my opinion, the answer to her question is, she mentioned the Jewish Cultural Center. All these gatherings of black and white and all cultures, during that time, they did not want that to go on. Because God forbid you have a white friend or a black friend or a Hispanic friend. You know, so I think that was the main issue. They didn't want that gathering of people together, which is why those communities were disbanded. I'm originally from Philadelphia. And the funny thing is, now, you know, I consider this a second chance community. To me, Philadelphia, is so, there's no way I can go back to Philly. It's just bad, you know, as we all know. You know, so it, 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 to me, it's, it's shocking watching this because I never felt that. I've only been there two years. And I feel very embraced in spite of my history, you know, uh, showing a lot of love. You know, so uh, hopefully things change, and I hope that you're able to find an apartment. And there is one in Adobe. I'm going <laughs> to. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Yes. Um, and I appreciate your comment yes. because even all the things that I am saying, I do also believe that Scranton is a very like welcoming um, communal place to live. But I do think that it is shaped. Um, by discrimination, honestly, there's a lot of like seeped in racism that we still need to overcome. Why are people still uncomfortable with having black neighbors or might have had a neighbor who was formerly incarcerated? Like most of the time, it's really not a big deal. But I think for me, I'm going to work on home ownership. But in the meantime, um, thank you. <laughs> and I've tried. But in the, and if yeah, I'm fighting this eviction very hard because I do think for me, um, my eviction, I think, is an example for what's happening in the city of Scranton. I'd rather have an eviction on my record than to leave and let this man treat me like crap and other people. So that's a conversation for another day. I do think we should have a forum on housing and let the people know and the city and the state know that there's a lot of problems happening here. Again, I am getting very passionate about it because when I started this project and seeing like my housing insecurity start to really, really open up, um, there was a lot of parallels that I was feeling and also feeling comforted by what the community was saying and also knowing I'm not the only person that's going through this. But again, it's like I'm living in my dad's neighborhood. He loves Southside. I'm over there like and then it almost feels like I'm being gentrified out of my own neighborhood because it's a predominantly multiracial block like. There's a lot of people from different backwards, backgrounds on my block, and it just feels like there's certain people buying properties on this block, not caring about people, raising the rent super, super high, and doesn't care, and will rather try and fight you with an eviction until they realize you know just as more about the court of law than your landlord does. So again, I'm going to keep fighting this in court. But I did feel today was the right time to bring it out to the public about my housing issues based on this, because I am a woman of color who's still trying to find housing here. And... Um, you know, I am lucky that I have a place to go to, but again, it's also in these low-income um, project housings that we're talking about, and there's nothing wrong with that inherently, but it kind of sucks that that has to be more of my safety net to go back to the projects versus being able to live in an apartment I can't afford and just stay there. So I digress. Any more questions? Um, just have a quick question. Uh, question comment. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say I'm so thankful for the uh, Black Scranton project. Um, I was a student here from uh, 2003 to 2007, 
And when I was here, I would never imagine there would be such a forum for this. So I know it, it's easy to get disheartened, but like it's, I never would have imagined this, um, this kind of moment being here. So like that's a lot of progress. Um, and also I can see we have a lot of students here. Um, and it's easy to think like this issue isn't really a big issue for you. Maybe you have your dorms. All I can say is the memes are true. You will find out. One way or the other, you will find out. And um, I also just would want to say, I don't think you get this kind of relocation, this kind of gentrification, without there being some sort of financial incentive that says that some lives matter more than others. And I was going to ask, to that end, do you think, um, in your personal belief, that housing is a basic human right Mm -hmm. And would reframing the issue of housing as a basic human right, just the right of being born a person, would that um, start to reframe the issue and try to address some of these inequities that we see? I would say yes. Um, I 100% agree that housing is a human right, first and foremost. But um, I will lay out a little statistic. So between 2019 and 2021, 25% of the, the single family housing market was bought up by corporations, like across the country. So now we see how that is impacting housing crisis or housing prices increasing and causing such a crisis. So um, it would be nice to see that, but it would we have to now start working on getting housing out of corporations' hands and also on these, in our area specifically, out of state landlords who just buy properties as investments, but also don't invest in the people that live there. So if that answers your question. Um, how you doing? Uh, I, I agree with you on a lot of stuff. Uh, my name is Mari. I moved from Philadelphia to the Scranton area myself, and I'm disabled, and I'm black, and I also have felonies. And um, <clears throat> and I've been struggling with the actually trying to get disabled housing because of my color. Um, it has... and. and I've worked and uh, I've, I've tried to use every resource that Lackawanna allegedly has. Um, I'm actually like, I, I do peer to peer with with the people that I'm here with now. I do a lot, I try to do a lot in the community to actually give back because I am a reformed person. I changed my life actually, went to Lackawanna College, all that. But I, I do believe you on on some situations as far as I believe it's like a lot of credentials we have to have. Like when it comes to a lot of these places, they don't want just the basics. They want to check into, okay, we want your background check. We don't want to just know if you can afford this place. We want to know your background check, your kid's background check. Mm -hmm. We want to know about your grandma. We want to know about like, it, it really gets like, and it's like, there is nobody like how to like wh who do you call do you call the police like and that, that's like my thing is like when these big time corporations and people that own all this property does not want to give you a chance when you have even if you have all the credentials and you do like you said use your white friends you know what i mean and then you pop up to sign a lease <laughs> it's it's say? it's a lot so it's uh for us to actually get anywhere. I, I feel like we do have a lot to accomplish. And I was wondering, like, do you guys have meetings? Like, how do I connect with the uh, I guess the black people of Scranton? I, 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 to be honest, I just heard about this. Like, I never even knew that you guys had a movement. Uh, when I moved to Scranton, I was like, where are the black people? Um, I'm Great dead guy. serious. I met her. I met I met a lot of people. I was like, where are the African Americans? Um. I see a lot of Spanish people. I see, you know, the Jewish community. I see a lot of, um, and when it came to that, I, I looked at it like a religion, not really a color. So, uh, you know, but I asked a lot of these questions and I didn't get any answers. So, I mean, if, if you could, uh, okay. do you guys have meetings? I'll try anything? and answer as many questions as I was able to catalog. So, um, you're right. I do think that the... Okay, um, so I do think that housing is a problem. The, th the thing about the community part, yes, we are here, but I don't think we're outside, outside, you know. 
Um, in terms of what we're doing with Black Scranton, I'm definitely trying to open it up to have more um, forums. Um, as you can see, we're putting together our Center for Arts and Culture. We don't have any like regular meetings or any pop-in things, but that's definitely something that we want to work in. We also um, want to hear from the community about like what do we want to talk about? What type of programs do we want to see? So um, the next thing we have coming up is tomorrow. We have an open mic at our center from doors open at 6. Um, so pop through tomorrow if you're interested. Um, if you have any ideas, send us an email. Um, we'd love to have you there. And you said you had a question first, the beginning kind of about housing. I can't remember exactly what it was. Um, you didn't agree with me in a lot of ways, which is good, because I don't think we all should agree on the same things. But um, my only kind of answer to you is, I think we got to start talking to our local officials, because the thing here is, we are voting for them <laughs> with the taxpayer vote. So like, these are the people who are gonna make some change. And I know it's not a popular opinion, okay? But I do think it works when you do go down to city, city hall and you talk to city council or um, you speak to your local officials. Um, as someone who's on the governor's commission for African American affairs, I definitely do bring up the housing problems. I definitely bring up the policing problems in this area. And I'll continue to do that. And I think we are starting to see a little bit of a change, but it's definitely not enough. Um, and again, and I never really thought about getting into the housing fight until I myself started going through some problems. I've seen it happen with other people. I faced problems when I was trying to get an apartment the first time, but um, that's the only solution that I have. That's the only thing I can think of that actually um, has proven to make a little bit of a difference, if that answers your question. We're going to take one more, one more question, question, I think, here. And then if we have other questions, we're going to hang around afterwards. So We'll hang around. Yes. Quintus, do you know if there, there was any study on how many were, were able to move back into the community once they finished uh, redevelopment? That's a great question. Um, I am not sure. I do know that they like gave the people that they kicked out to build Midtown apartments priority to move in, and I do know a lot of people did take that offer, um, but I don't know exactly like number wise how many just based on you know living oral histories in the community of people saying what they are saying um, and I do know from what I've heard in the community that um, there there some people were under the impression that Midtown Apartments was going to be a rent to own situation or um, a gateway into home ownership that they never actually achieved so we have more questions but I think we're gonna we're gonna pause here and we'll stay around for a few minutes um, to, to take some more questions and continue the conversation. I want to thank Linus for this presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> and we, are, we do invite more stories, so we want to thank Kathy and Norma for sharing their stories, but you have different opportunities online and as you walk out to share your stories and as we continue this project this year. So please come out to other events and thank you again for all for being here. Thank you so much.